Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to my How to Home Lab series. In the previous video, I gave you guys a soft introduction to Raspberry Pi and why you might want to consider running one or more of those on your home lab. In today's video, we are again going to go over the Raspberry Pi, but specifically, I am going to talk about three example applications that you can run on your Raspberry Pi in your home lab, which is going to be a ton of fun. Specifically, what I'm going to walk you through is how to set up Open Media Vault, which is a great NAS solution. I'm also going to talk about Nextcloud. I will show you the process, but I'm actually going to link to another video where I go over the process in greater detail, which also works fine on the Raspberry Pi. We'll talk about that. And then I will also talk about Pihole, which is a great ad blocking DNS server that'll also add value to your home lab network. Now, before we get into that, I want to take a moment to mention the sponsor for today's video, Kernel Care. Raspberry Pi is a great platform for Home Lab. We'll see three examples of that in this very video. But just like any other Linux server, your Pi still needs to be updated every now and then. Now, you could make it a habit to manually update it on a regular basis, but we're all human and we're all especially busy nowadays. So, what if you forget? And let's face it, Raspberry Pi may have started out as a platform for testing and learning, but it's become so much more than that. As you navigate building your own home lab, it's very possible that your Raspberry Pi may have become a critically important component on your network. It could be your DNS server, DHCP server, file server, or even a hub for home automation. If an actively exploited vulnerability is leveraged to make your Pi obey someone else rather than you, it can be incredibly time consuming to rebuild it. So essentially, Raspberry Pi owners are running into the same issues that enterprise IT admins face. Thankfully, Cloud Linux, the makers of Kernel Care, have made an announcement recently that has me extremely excited. The Raspberry Pi is now supported on their platform. This means that you can take advantage of automatic kernel patching, which is a very important layer when it comes to security. Kernel Care runs in the background looking for available patches for your kernel. When a patch becomes available, it will live patch your running kernel and you can take advantage of those patches without rebooting your Pi. This makes it even easier to transform your Pi into an always on appliance. And best of all, you can take advantage of this service on a single Raspberry Pi for free. And I don't mean free as in free for a limited time. It's not a demo. You actually can get a full license for Kernel Care for your Raspberry Pi with the same capabilities that are available in a commercial license. And it only takes a few commands in order to get started. Currently, the Raspberry Pi 4 is supported along with the Pi 3 and later models of the Pi 2. As for distributions, Ubuntu 2004 is supported already and support for Debian and Raspberry Pi OS is coming soon. If you want to go beyond a single Raspberry Pi and use Kernel Care for a commercial project, check out Kernel Care for IoT, which is a dedicated offering for that very purpose. But if you have a single Raspberry Pi and you'd like to get that set up with reboot free patching, you should definitely grab a free license of Kernel Care as there's simply no reason not to do so. Reboot free automatic kernel patching is too good of a security benefit to pass up. So check it out at the URL that you see on the screen right now which is also linked down below in the description, and get free kernel patching for your Raspberry Pi today. Thank you so much to Kernel Care and Cloud Linux for their continued support of Learn Linux TV. I really appreciate it. Now, let's go ahead and get into the content at hand and talk about hosting three different applications on the Raspberry Pi. Let's check them out. So first of all, what do you need in order to get started? Well, obviously, you're going to need a Raspberry Pi or a few Raspberry Pis if you want to go ahead and set up multiple applications. And yes, you can actually set up multiple applications on one Pi. I get that question a lot. But I always go through the process of having one application per Pi whenever I can. It's just the way that I prefer it. So in this video, I am going to talk to you guys about setting up each of the three applications that I mentioned in the intro as if they were the only application on each Pi that you're running. 
but with a little bit of config and fine tuning, you actually probably can run each of these three on one. So you'll need a Raspberry Pi, you'll need an SD card, preferably a good SD card, the better the card, the faster the speed, and then you will need an AC adapter because, well, how else are you going to power your Raspberry Pi? With a lemon? Well, actually, I shouldn't say things like that because somebody might actually think of it as a challenge. And, well, if you are able to power your Raspberry Pi with a lemon, definitely record it and send me the footage. Now, optionally, you can consider a case. You don't need a case, but having a Raspberry Pi board just out in the open, it doesn't look all that cool. Well, I guess it does look kind of cool depending on your definition of cool. But either way, a case for your Raspberry Pi will not be a bad investment. The Argon 1 V2, that's one of my favorite cases. And if you are going to be running more than one Pi, you could actually consider a cluster case. And that's actually what is behind me when I record my videos. The glowing fans are actually cluster cases. I'll have links down below in the description for my recommended components. Now, for the operating system, I went ahead and went with Raspberry Pi OS, which used to be called Raspbian, and that's the distribution I've decided to go along with for this project. And regardless of which apps you may want to run on your Pi, Raspberry Pi OS is a great choice. I decided to download the Lite edition, which has no desktop or GUI at all. That way, there's no graphical apps eating up my memory. But it doesn't really matter though, you can still use the version with the desktop environment if you want to. You might not even notice a difference. So, to get Raspberry Pi OS installed, if you don't already have it flashed onto your SD card, just simply insert the micro SD into the adapter, if necessary, and then you can insert the SD card into your computer. When it comes to how to flash the Raspberry Pi software, consider using a dedicated utility. In this video, I decided to go with RPI Imager. This is the official tool from the Raspberry Pi project, which is able to facilitate the process of flashing the Raspberry Pi OS image onto the SD card. And honestly, I didn't even know that it existed before I started this project. I don't know how this went under my radar. As an alternative, I do have a video on my channel already that goes through the process of using USB Imager, and that's able to do the exact same thing. I'll insert a card right about here. But anyway, I used the RPI Imager for this project because I wanted to try something new, and it worked fine for me. Now, before you go ahead and insert the freshly flashed SD card into your Pi, there's a few things that you might want to consider doing first, a few tweaks, if you will. First of all, consider adding a config file for WPA Supplicant, which will automate the process of connecting your Pi to your Wi-Fi network if you want to actually connect via Wi-Fi. Now, I recommend Ethernet is just more stable, but I get it. Not everyone has an Ethernet jack wherever they are setting up their Pi, so if you need to set up Wi-Fi, well, no judgment. So first of all, you can grab the config file from the description down below. I will actually have a link to a wiki article that'll have all the commands in there and links as well. And then you grab your two character country code. You put that in the file. And then you add your Wi-Fi name and password. And you are saving that file in the boot volume on your SD card. Now, additionally, you can consider creating an empty file called SSH also on the boot volume. If you do that, it's going to cause OpenSSH to be automatically enabled at first boot, which makes it that much easier to connect. And that's what I do basically every time. So, after you make any of those tweaks, if you did actually want to make any of those tweaks, just safely eject the SD card and insert it into your Pi. Also, connect an Ethernet cable, again, recommended, and the AC adapter. After a few minutes, the Pi should boot up, and you can follow along with the process if you have a display connected, although I almost never use a display. 
I just basically configure mine over the network. So in my case, I just logged into PFSense, which is my router slash firewall software of choice. I looked at the DHCP lease table. I found that a device with the host name of Raspberry Pi connected and received an IP address. So I immediately knew which one I needed to target with SSH. I logged in with the Pi user, the default password of Raspberry, and then I was in. Now, I highly recommend that you create a static lease. A static lease is also known as a DHCP reservation. The reason why I prefer that is because with a static IP, you configure that inside the software, inside the distribution. But with a static lease, your DHCP server is always assigning the same IP address to the device, which means if for some reason you have to reflash the SD card, the Raspberry Pi will always get the same IP address because it won't depend on the settings inside the SD card since the router slash firewall is responsible for providing the IP address. Either way, you basically want to make sure that the IP address won't change regardless of whether you set a static IP manually or you go in your router slash firewall and create a static lease. Now I can't walk you through the process of creating a static lease for every single firewall slash router possibility there is out there. So I will leave it up to you to set that up. Next, I recommend that you set the host name and that's not required, but it is a good idea because that allows you to better differentiate your Pi from any others that you might have. So just give it a recognizable name along with its purpose. As you just saw when I looked it up in PFSense, it had a generic name of Raspberry Pi. I do have a video that talks more about setting the host name of a Linux instance if you're interested, card right here, but it's pretty self-explanatory to change the host name. And then after that, I went ahead and installed all of the updates, and I recommend you do the same. You definitely want to make sure that you start out with everything up to date, especially for security purposes. Then after you install all of the updates, I recommend that you reboot the Pi, and then we can continue. Now the process for setting up Nextcloud is actually exactly the same as my recent Nextcloud video. So I don't want to repeat the entire process here. For testing and for capturing the footage for this video, I literally copied and pasted all of the commands from the wiki article for that video directly into my Raspberry Pi and everything worked exactly as it should. So rather than repeat all of those commands here, I recommend that you check out that particular video because again, the process is identical. I'll put a card right here that links you over to that video. And I will also have a link down below to the wiki article for that Nextcloud video because all of the commands that you need in order to set up Nextcloud are all on that page. Now let's talk a little bit about Open Media Vault. The process for setting up Open Media Vault is actually a lot easier than Nextcloud. In fact, among the three applications that I'm going over in this video, it's absolutely the easiest one to install. And that's because it's literally just one command. Now, Open Media Vault is a great solution for network attached storage. My personal NAS server of choice is actually TrueNAS, but for TrueNAS, you need a little bit more horsepower than a Raspberry Pi is able to provide. So if you want to set up a network attached storage server and you want to do so on a budget, then Open Media Vault is definitely the best way to go. It has a very easy user interface to set everything up. And like I mentioned, it's easy to install as well. So the command that is on your screen right now, which is also in the wiki article for this video, is the only command that you need to run to set this up. It takes quite a while to install though. I didn't actually time it, but it felt like longer than a half an hour. But then again, I have ADD, so anything more than five minutes feels like a half hour to me. But it did feel like a long time, and other people say that it takes a long time to install. So I'm just gonna go along with the fact that it takes a long time to install. So basically, all you should do is just run that command, Give us some time to finish, go grab some coffee, lunch, or whatever you want, come back and check it later. Once it's finished, you can enter the IP address of your Pi into your browser, and that should bring up the login screen for Open Media Vault if everything went well. 
The default username is admin, and the default password is Open Media Vault. After you log in, you can create a share, and on my end, I simply inserted a flash drive, and using FDisk, I blew away the entire partition table of that flash drive. I've used that drive to install many Linux distributions. I wanted to make sure that everything was completely purged, so that's why I did that. And then I was able to format it and set it up in the interface. But essentially the takeaway is that you can use a flash drive if you want to use that as your storage backend for Open Media Vault. And in a previous video, I actually went over an attachment that allows you to connect a SATA drive to your Pi, which is an even better choice if you have the extra money. I'll have links down below where you can order an attachment that will allow you to attach an SSD to your Pi. Now finally, let's talk about Pi-hole. Pi-hole is a DNS server, but not just any DNS server. It's an ad-blocking DNS server. By setting your devices to use Pi-hole as the preferred DNS address, it'll actually cause ads that would be displayed when you browse the internet to have their lookups fail and fail on purpose, because generally speaking, we don't want to see ads. Pi-hole is almost exactly as easy to install as Open Media Vault, and it takes a fraction of the time to set it up. In fact, Pi-hole actually has a one-liner command to install it as well, so I decided to go with the slightly longer process, which is still just a few commands anyway. First, you install git, and then once you install that package, you can download the Pi-hole repo, again, the commands are in the wiki article, and then you change directory into the repository folder, and then you run the command that you see on the screen right now to go ahead and install it. Now for most of the prompts, I went ahead and just went along with the defaults for pretty much everything. Feel free to answer any of the prompts differently to suit your needs. At some point, it's going to prompt you to set a static IP, which you can do if you'd like. Again, I prefer static leases, but choose whatever is best for your situation. So, with all of the setup done, Pi-hole should be ready to go. And then what you can do is log into whatever your DHCP server is, and then instruct it to hand out the IP address of your Pi-hole server to all of your clients, and that should allow you to deploy Pi-hole to every machine on your network. And from that point on, you should see fewer ads when you browse the net. So there you go. We've gone over three applications that you can run in your home lab powered by Raspberry Pi in this video. I hope at least one of those applications was right up your alley and has added benefit to your home lab network. In the next video, we're going to shift gears and talk about hypervisors. In fact, I have a very special direction I want to take that video, and I'm not going to give it away, but it is going to be a lot of fun. In fact, I've already started the process of filming that one, and I'm about halfway done, so you should see it fairly soon. Just make sure you subscribe to my channel, so that way you will be notified as soon as that video is out. In the meantime, though, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.